Who do you think of when you hear the term alt-right? Is it her? Or her? How about her? Probably not. When most people hear the term alt-right, they probably imagine a bunch of men, right? Perhaps neo-Nazis with fashy haircuts, maybe images of prominent alt-right figures like Richard Spencer, Steve Bannon, or former Breitbart sweetheart Milo Yiannopoulos. Much has been said and written about the men of the white nationalist movement called the alt-right, as well as the online manosphere, including incels, pickup artists, and men going their own way, which serves as fertile recruiting grounds for the alt-right cesspools of what some might call toxic masculinity. What's less talked about is the increasing role of women in the movement, a toxic femininity, if you will, lurking beneath the surface, recruiting, organizing, and propagating fear and anxiety through misinformation and threats of rape scourges. So who are these women, and why would they want to be part of a group which actively seeks to subjugate and dominate them? I mean, most of these women regularly face an onslaught of hate and misogyny spewed their way, not only by anonymous trolls on digital platforms like 4chan, Twitter, and Reddit, but by outspoken voices and supposed leaders of the movement. Take author, blogger, and white nationalist Matt Forney, who has written articles like The Case Against Female Self-Esteem and How to Beat Your Girlfriend or Wife and Get Away With It. Richard Spencer, originator of the term alt-right, has said that women should not be allowed to vote or make foreign policy because, quote, their vindictiveness knows no bounds. And Stefan Molyneux, a white supremacist, race realist who amplifies eugenics, said this about women. Women who choose the assholes will fucking end this race. Keep fucking monstrous we get catastrophes. When women worship at the feet of the devil and wonder why the world is evil. So yeah, there's that. And yet we have far-right women like Lauren Southern actually going on tour with men like Molyneux. What kind of woman would choose to associate with men that believe things like this? Well, that's what we're here to explore today. Hey guys, so before I begin, I just want to take a minute and say thank you so much to my new subscribers. I just reached 5k subs and I am just super grateful. Um, I'm going to be doing a Q&A, um, so if you have any questions uh, that you would like me to answer, leave them in the comments below. Also, uh, I decided after three years of being on YouTube to start a Patreon. So if y'all like my work and would like to continue helping me uh, in this video making journey, uh, please consider contributing. The link is in the description below. Okay, so anyways, back to the video. Lana Lochtef, Faith Goldie, Ayla Stewart, otherwise known as Wife with a Purpose. These are the faces of the women of the alt-right, and they play a vital role. Although popular conceptions of the alt-right may see women as invisible, the truth is that women have been active participants in white extremist movements for as long as they've existed. While the march in Charlottesville occurred in relation to the proposed removal of a statue of a Confederate general, women were responsible for the erection of many of these Confederate statues across the country at the turn of the 20th century. In the 1920s, women composed the most influential arm of the KKK, and lest we forget the election that emboldened these modern white supremacists, more than half of white women voted for Trump. To overlook the comprehensive picture of who makes up the extreme right is to seriously underestimate its reach. To understand this further, I want to break apart an article written by Ashley Mathis titled Shield Maidens of Whiteness, Alt-Maternalism and Women Recruiting for the Far-Alt-Right. 
In it, she examines the rhetoric of Lana Lochtef, one of the alt-right's most prominent women, to help explain why women joined the movement, how they view themselves, and to uncover some of the main recruiting strategies used to get more women involved. Lochtef is an American white supremacist political commentator married to Henrik Palmgren, and together they run the alt-right media company Red Ice. Launched in 2002, Red Ice began its run propagating conspiracy theories about the Illuminati, 9-11, and UFOs. But beginning in 2012, the content shifted to conspiracies surrounding race. One such theory being the Great Replacement, which suggests a progressive replacement of white Christian Europeans with non-European people through mass immigration and low birth rates among white people. And apparently, this is some master plan, a white genocide as they like to call it, seamlessly being orchestrated by the Jews. Lochtef also hosts a talk radio show called Radio 314, focused heavily on white culture and identity, and plenty of interviews with alt-right women. And if you listen to enough of these women talk, some salient themes begin to emerge. Also, some blinding contradictions. Choosing to align their values with those of the alt-right, these women become part of a movement which believes that women's increased autonomy has crippled Western civilization as we know it. Part 1. Gendered Complementarity one of the main themes running through alt-right discourse regarding gender is the idea that men and women are biologically different, but that these difference, differences complement each other and work together. So, according to this theory, women are naturally designed to be subservient, gentle caregivers, while men contain innate leadership abilities, great physical prowess, and rational decision-making skills. So naturally, women belong at home raising the kids, while men belong at work and doing manly stuff. However, if we take a look at the movement's most prominent women, we quickly see that they do not practice what they preach. Lauren Southern, although maybe considered alt-light by some, pushes trad life culture, but is an unmarried, childless pseudo-journalist. Faith Goldie yells at women to keep their legs closed and wait for marriage, yet we know of let's just say indiscretions she's had while engaged. Well, one indiscretion which has been confirmed. Even Lana Lochtef, while married with kids, promotes full-time stay-at-home momdom while simultaneously running and participating in her and her husband's company, conducting interviews, making videos, and even has her own clothing line. And just to make it clear, I obviously have no problem with women working and raising kids at the same time. This just isn't the message of the alt-right. Now, if you ask me, many of these women, I definitely say women like Faith Goldie and Lauren Southern are just plain opportunists. They recognized the alt-right as an untapped repository of male attention and income and pounced. I mean, Lauren Southern made her career dressing provocatively and posing for scantily clad photos on Instagram and Twitter while simultaneously propagating modesty and traditional family values on YouTube. Faith Goldie has similarly capitalized on her appearance mixed with a purposefully provocative far-right message, even attempting a run for mayor of Toronto, parroting Trump-like rhetoric such as make Toronto safe again and the media is truly the enemy of the people. Women like Southern and Goldie provide the ultimate male fantasy, Good-looking women talking about the failure of feminism and the importance of traditional gender roles, fulfilling the ultimate cool girl trope, if you will. Of course, the contradiction here is blinding, right? If women's proper role is supposed to be in the house, how do women like Goldie and Southern and Lochtef reconcile this with their active roles fighting for white preservation, often taking on positions of leadership, which is completely antithetical to the movement's stated values of women as caretakers? 
This is the first contradiction. Another contradiction emerges as alt-right women demand others recognize their decision to be part of such a movement as a choice and not something forced upon them by men or some sort of internalized misogyny, while at the same time preaching subordination to men. In order to navigate these apparent contradictions, Lochtef, who I want to focus in on for a minute, and other alt-right women often summon the image of the Viking shield maidens. See, white supremacists love to call upon Norse mythology and stories of the Vikings to provide archetypes used to prop themselves up. For example, they make historically inaccurate claims on indigenous lands, specifically in Northern Europe and North America, acting as if they weren't given credit for what's rightfully theirs. They position themselves as victims and victors. On the one hand, their land was stolen, like in the case of Vinland, and on the other, they are mighty, fierce white warriors conquering weakling natives who couldn't protect their lands, like in the United States. Catch the contradiction? Anyways, for women of the alt-right, the Viking shield maiden in particular provides a powerful archetype for white women. It denotes grudging women warriors forced to fight for their survival, taking on a quote-unquote man's role in order to protect their family because they're under attack. And here we get to the crux of the argument. According to far-right ideology, Women are designed to desire beautiful things, to enjoy taking care of the home and children. But because Western white civilization is literally under attack and being threatened with extinction, well, women must now pick up a sword and take action. It's literally life or death. But don't take my word for it. Here's Lochtef explaining it herself. Like then, women honored beauty. Let's not forget about Freya, the archetypal beauty. That's, that's what women want. And that's healthy, and we should have that. But they also honor family and home. But occasionally, they had to pick up a sword and fight in emergency situations. The shield maidens, the Vikings, right? Like today, women of the right would love to simply tend to the home and make their surroundings beautiful. And I wish that's all we had to do. And I know our ancestors worked to the bone in order for us to be able to have that luxury. But many women such as myself are realizing that this is an emergency situation. Our countries are being destroyed by leftists and anti-whites, and the future for our children is looking gloom. Although I think women are too emotional for leading roles in politics, this is the time for female nationalists to be loud. Did you notice how she had to emphasize women's true nature as being that of overly emotional? This way, she manages to make her point, throw out a call to action to all the women out there, and sort of mask that with a reminder of women's inferiority, so as not to emasculate all the men out there, right? And this is the balance that must constantly be brokered as women attempt to negotiate their place in the movement. By the way, as I'm sure most of us know, women as too emotional is a stereotype dating back centuries. In fact, it was the father of medicine himself, Hippocrates, who coined the term hysteria and the wandering uterus to account for women's extreme mood swings and erratic behavior. It was a stereotype used to refuse women the vote and is a stereotype conjured up today to devalue women's performance at work and to prevent their rise up the organizational hierarchy and to stifle their chances politically. I should also add that such a binary framework for understanding gender inherently excludes those who fall outside such a heteronormative paradigm. Non-binary, transgender, gay, lesbian, or bisexual folks are shunned. If you don't want children, you're also probably out. If you don't fit into this cookie-cutter definition of what it means to be a man or a woman as defined by them, you're out. And just like Ian Danskin talks about in his alt-right playbook, they will continue to find narrower definitions of the word woman and man in the same way they will continue to find narrower definitions of the word white. 
because groups like the alt-right are defined by what they are not, the other. Take all the others away, and they start creating otherness among each other. They thrive on stripping people of their rights and maintaining some sort of ill-defined sense of purity, and so will never be satisfied. Part 2. Alt-Maternalism Tied to the notion of gendered complementarity is the idea of alt-maternalism, the natural role of women as mothers tied in with their duty to protect their children from multiculturalism and cultural Marxism and to instill values of white identity and supremacy. And in fact, alt-right women often conjure up images of fierce mothers, lionesses, and valkyries as another way to defend women's active roles in the movement as being that of protective mothers rather than hungry for power. Fighting for survival of their white children then becomes the motivation which provides a less intimidating picture to all the insecure man babies out there. By rooting white supremacy in maternalism, or the idea that we just want to preserve a healthy culture for our children and ensure the survival of white culture, they make it seem somewhat kind of common sense. And maternalist claims are claims that resonate with a lot of women in the mainstream. Just look at the recent surge of women who've entered the online sphere in the past few years called trad wives. Women living the trad life fully embrace the 1950s traditional housewife role, which involves keeping a beautiful home, dutifully serving the husband, and bearing as many children as possible. They make videos titled, Why You Should Homeschool Your Children and The Loss of Femininity. And although trad life is not inherently tied to white nationalism, it becomes a significant pool from which the alt-right can recruit. After all, it makes sense that a movement grounded in patriarchal and misogynistic values might be susceptible to a movement rooted in racist values. Take Ayla Stewart, otherwise known as Wife with a Purpose, a blogger and trad life YouTuber who regularly posts videos about white preservation, and in 2017 actually issued a white baby challenge to combat black ghetto culture. Yeah. Or stay-at-home mom trad life advocate Brie Fouché, who made the switch from trad wife to full-on white supremacist trad wife shortly after joining Lana Lochtef's radio show, Radio 314. Women like Brie and Ayla do a great job of sanitizing the image of white supremacy, making them incredibly useful entry points into the alt-right pipeline. They present themselves as these perfectly manicured, ultra-feminine, seemingly innocent housewives. It's an image that is purposefully crafted to obscure the strict and repressive ideology that they follow. An ideology that involves raising racist kids and reminiscing about the good old days when family outings included attendance at public lynchings. And although I can't ever imagine being attracted to such a movement, I can kind of see how some might get sucked in. As Annie Kelly points out in her article titled The Housewives of White Supremacy, the alt-right, like all other mass movements, is ultimately a movement born out of a dissatisfaction with modern life. Tradwives help us understand the sources of that dissatisfaction by revealing points of overlap between red lipsticked mothers of six and the men who complain of being kissless virgins. There's something to this nostalgia for a fictitious leave it to beaver kind of past in which the dad works tirelessly in support of his family, is home for family dinner every night by six, and where the mom cleans the house in high heels and pearls, right? In this fairy tale, there are no kissless virgins. There are no working moms. Contrast that with our modern day reality, stagnating wages, job insecurity, and constant pressure on family relations. 
it's no wonder more and more people are depressed and anxious and reminiscing or clinging to a time where the perfect family setting seemed to exist, where sex was bountiful, and where consumer wants were always satisfied. Of course, this was never the case, just to be clear, uh, but you get my point. Now, for some women, here is where anti-feminist logic often comes to the front. Instead of blaming a strangling economic and political system, they will instead blame those nasty feminists whose fight for the vote and right to work was actually akin to war on the nuclear family and in fact stole women's opportunity to live a life of luxury at home. To quote Annie Kelly again, the men on the alt-right might point to diversity initiatives and mass immigration as having dismantled their career prospects. The women are furious that they have to consider career prospects at all. It's quite funny, actually, because on the one hand, these women will rail against feminism for trying to make women equal. And when this inevitably leads to misogyny and sexism in the movement, Women like Lauren Southern and Tara McCarthy will cry for respect and equality. To quote Rachel Lee, while McCarthy would like to see racism without the sexism in the white supremacist movement, and Southern would appreciate it if anti-feminist women were given the ability to choose for themselves what kind of life they want to lead, it's worth wondering if these women are liberal. And I'd wonder feminist. This, of course, doesn't stop the hypocrisy. I mean, anti-feminist rhetoric is a hallmark of the alt-right, and in fact, it is often used to evoke fear and anxiety among women. Part 3. Politics of Fear Another point of contention of the alt-right regarding feminism is the supposed failed promises of the sexual revolution. Alt-right women claim that women are more exploited, more objectified than ever, that traditionalism can provide for women what feminism can't. A life of modesty, marriage, and motherhood. It's an enticing proposal for some, and it's also bullshit fear-mongering. We all know that humble attire doesn't prevent rape, and marriage doesn't prevent domestic violence from happening. Unfortunately, this type of rhetoric is actually pretty effective. Turns out, fear is a great motivator. And the alt-right knows how to evoke fear. See, they position themselves as victims. Victims of mass immigration, Black Lives Matter, and miscegenation. They act as if they are under constant attack, constant threat, and then claim self-defense when a fight erupts. They say, look at these migrants looking to rape all our women. Look at these black people and their rap music spreading violence. And ugh, these anti-fascists are so violent. You should be afraid, very afraid. And it's very effective. Women like Lana Lochtef and Brittany Pettibone are masters of using this type of rhetoric, particularly threats of rape scourges, to recruit white women into the movement by portraying immigrants and refugee men as uncivilized barbarians coming to render white women impure. On the contrary, when white men sleep with immigrant or refugee women, it is the women that are blamed. They are portrayed as morally unrestrained Jezebels seeking to steal what's rightfully meant for white women, that being Western civilization. And here comes another common discursive element of the alt-right. Western civilization being the culmination of white men's desire to please white women, a gift, if you will, the ultimate romantic gesture. In this framework, male violence, hate, and bigotry becomes romanticized. Genocide and war become acceptable because they are doing it for love. This sort of provides a culmination of all the ideas from before. It takes gender complementarity and alt materialism and uses those discursive elements to weave a tale of white European lineage. White men fulfilling their biologically determined desire to procreate, white women fulfilling their biological desires to have a family and get married, and together they create Western white civilization. 
And furthermore, men taking on their role as fighter and protector of white culture in order to protect what's theirs, i.e. their women and their children. See, many alt-right men believe that they own white women and their wounds. For example, Andrew England, founder of the neo-Nazi website The Daily Stormer, complained in 2016 that women procreating with non-white men are traitors, using, quote, our womb, that's right, it doesn't belong to her, to produce an enemy soldier. And so if you believe all that, then it only makes sense that white people should have their own white states, right? After all, white men created Western civilization. It should be theirs to reside upon, right? Of course, this whole narrative is based upon an illusion, a ton of false premises which don't hold up under the least bit of scrutiny. Vikings were never this white monolith. Norse mythology is just that, mythology. Immigrants are not coming in droves to rape white women. They're actually fleeing extreme poverty and violent rep repression and authoritarian regimes. And the stats that the alt-right uses to support their rape scourge lie are ridiculously misleading. Uh, I'll leave links in the description for more on that. White genocide is not a thing. Patriarchy is not akin to freedom. And Jews are not conspiring to take over the world. So yeah, I know this was probably a lot. I just think it's really important that we not underestimate the role of women in this movement and that we actively work to dismantle their flawed arguments, their recruiting strategies, and to call out their rhetoric for what it is, racist, misogynistic, fear-mongering filth. Furthermore, I think the left can appeal to some of these demographics as well. For instance, stay-at-home moms. I mean, there's a reason we focus on climate change and inequality and institutional power imbalances. We want this world to be better for future generations. We want children to have the best chance for success. And that means having access to healthcare and education and breakfast. We support stay-at-home moms and working moms. And most importantly, we support moms having the resources available to be able to make that choice for themselves. So yeah, if you like this video, give it a like. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please leave them in the comments below. Um, leave a question for my Q&A, um, share, and subscribe. And most importantly, I want to shout out my very first patrons. Aaron Siegfried, P.D. Morin, Catherine, Chrissy Ta, Hugh Laurie, and Sarah Allison. Thank you guys so much. It really means a lot. And thanks so much for watching, guys.